don't. Don't last forever. We was all, I was teed, I meant to tell you this last week, but uh, it just slipped my mind, but um, I was on a job in Anderson two weeks ago, and I was didn't know nobody was around. Well, I was, and that's usually when I sing when nobody's around. Nobody wants to hear me, Brother Darrell. But I was singing. I started a journey many years ago looking for peace and rest for my, for my soul. And I found it at Calvary. And the song was, I think I'll just go with God. Well, I was singing that. And there was a... a <clears throat> AT&T, Southern Bell, whatever, guy working on, he come around the side of the house, Avery, and, and he looked and he said, he said, that's, a, that's some good singing. I said, well, we try. I said, I was singing about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ain't no better person to sing about. And you know what he said? He said, I've been saved for a week and a half. And I said, that is a blessing. I said, and I said, got rejoicing with him. And I said, um, you know, we're on our way to heaven. We're going to heaven. And, and uh, the Lord's going to be with us and all that. And I said, by the way, how old are you? He said, I'm 58 years old. And I thought just for a minute, ain't it amazing? And they older than that that, that trust Christ, not a lot. But ain't it amazing that 58 years of age just put yourself in that position? I don't know how old you was when you come to know Christ. Uh, 58 years of his life just kicking the can down the road and God showing up one day. I sat yesterday with Brother Ken just a little bit and we, we rejoiced and we talked about the Lord and talked about politics and talked about health and talked about everything you could imagine and I was sitting there and he going to talk about when he trusted Christ and that's what we was all doing going about our way kicking can down the road and God just showed up and I always ask the question why and it's found in John 3 16 that's the reason why do I totally understand it? No, I don't. Never claim to be, never will. But I'm sure glad that it happened to me. And we wept and we cried and we rejoiced. And, and uh, familiarity breeds contempt. The more you're around it, the more or less effective it is. But every now and then, we need to get a glimpse back where God found us and how he loved us, Brother Billy, so much. If he would take the time out of his busy schedule to go visit Charles and go visit Judy, All of us make up the same. And the answer why is John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. But to hear somebody 58 years old say, I've been saved a week and a half, that's amazing. For him to be at that, you, you ever wonder when things like that happen, you wonder, you know, there's a reason why that happened. There's a reason why I was... There was a reason why that song was on my mind, and I was singing that song at that time, and that man come around inside the house. You ever wonder why things happen like that? Days of divine purpose for everything. And I don't know why. Uh, maybe that young Christian, and, and you know, you know good, the great thing about it? I didn't ask him where he was going to church. We, we fellowshiped around the grace of God, the blood of Jesus Christ. That's, and I know a lot of people tell you that I'm, you know, I'm saved, their idea of saved. But when we begin to talk about 
the grace of God, the, the blood that was shed on Calvary, and repentance and forgiveness, and y'all, both of y'all have the, right, the same answer, that's right. Amen? To have the same answer between us. Conviction, repentance, Christ shed his blood on the cross, all of that. And what, you know, makes me wonder, there's a purpose and a divine reason for everything. Amen? I figured I'd share that with you this morning. But open your Bibles back to Hebrews chapter number 13. I've, I'm still in verse number 20 and just kind of walking through some of this and developing a few things along the way. And I alliterated this verse 20 like this. And, and I try to alliterate some. Again, it just helps me remember it a little better when I do it. But um, just kind of systematic. But um, verse number 20, I'm going to read that. Um, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, and just as he requested prayer in verse 19, for them, he's actually, uh, for them to pray for him, he's actually praying for them in this light. Now the God of peace. And then when you look at verse number 21, when we make our way down to it, there, that, that petition for them to God is make you perfect in every good work to do his will. That's the, the, the final thing that he's going to say in his desire for them in their life as, as Christians in, the, in this book of Hebrews. But when I went through verse number 20, I, and, I, and what I'm going to do is try to develop each one of these little points. When, when I look at verse number 20, now the God of peace, and I call that the perfect title for God. Out of all the titles you could give him, the perfect title for God, how would you summarize God? The perfect title for God is what? What would it be? The God of peace. That, that, out of all the characteristics, Billy, about God, and there's many words you can, you can use to summarize the God that we serve, I could find no greater, um, no greater word than to describe Jehovah God than the God of peace. But, but wait a minute. When I read the Bible, I, I, I read, and you start reading it, you find phrases like this. That God is angry with the wicked every day. Now, how does that, how does that correlate with the God of peace? If I could see things like God is an angry God, if, if I could see things like chapter 12 the last part of chapter 12, it almost seems like a contradiction, Brother David, that God is a consuming fire. You look at that chapter 12, the last thing that was mentioned in chapter 12, that God is a consuming fire. But then you come to chapter 13, verse number 20, the last uh, run to make up everything about God and the Lord Jesus. He goes from God is a consuming fire, that God is angry with the wicked every day, and then he says, the God of peace. Almost seems like a contradiction, don't it? Because you go from a consuming fire to God is peace. And, and I said, how do we explain the very essence that God is peace when we must remember that God is a consuming fire? And the only way that I can explain it it's two ways. Number one, in the context it was written. Because look at what he's saying unto the Hebrews. This is the last thing he's saying to them. After everything he's already said, this is the last salutation, the last word of encouragement. But he wants them to remember, not to forget, that to summarize everything about God is that God is a God of peace. And then, number two, it would be that God is a God of peace that leads peace through strength. I know y'all have heard that. I've heard Donald Trump say that, that you lead a country 
heard that, getting political. Yeah, I, I, and we are being live streamed this morning, so everybody know I'm voting for Donald Trump. Okay, there we go. No, no, no hesitation. Just want everybody to know that, nothing secret. But he had the word to say that you lead through peace to strength. I'll agree with that. When I look at that in light that God is peace and in God is a kingdom of fire, you know what I say? I say that there's nothing weak about God, not a thing weak about God. That God's strength makes him the God of peace. Amen? So when you look at the title of God, that his characteristic is that he's, that he's strong, his strength is through peace. So don't forget that God is a God of peace. I call it the perfect title of God, many characteristics. And then when I look at that, I would look at that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ. This salutation. So here is the perfect title of God. Number one, the message about God personified as we would look at it. So we have his title, that he's a God of peace. But let's personify that a little bit. Let's magnify that a little bit. Let's look at not a small God, but let's look at a big God. Let's label it like this, deity's divine title. How would I summarize God? No greater peace than God's peace. No greater peace than God's peace. There's not a peace that can be manufactured that can equivalent or match the peace of God. I've heard some of you say it, say it like this, and the writer said, don't forget that there is a peace that passes all understanding. I've heard the testimony from some of you over the years. I've talked with you, you've talked with me, and we have the same focus about God. And you look back down the road, and I don't understand it, but thank God I've experienced it. You look back down the road, and you wonder, how did I come through that? And you say things like this, I don't know how I'm going to make it. But you stand on the other side of the river and you look back down the road and there was something that brought you to a place of calm and ease and helped you go through that. Where did it come from? It come from the greatest peace that cannot be matched, this world can ever match the peace of God, and that's why the title is Divinity's Divine Title, that God is a God of peace. And is, if I personify that or if I magnify that, I would say it like this, no greater peace than God's peace. And Isaiah said, let me tell you something. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Great peace have they which love thy law, nothing shall offend them. And in Isaiah 26, verse number 3, that the peace of God would keep that person whose mind it stayed upon thee. As the mind stays upon the great peace which is God, that transfers the peace of God into the mind of the one whose mind's on God. So actually, when our mind's on God, it's not on nothing else. So the peace that God has is transferred into us which need the peace of God.
Does that make sense? As you're going through things, with everything you can, keep your mind stayed on the Lord. Camp out on the things of God. When it, and the old saying says, when it gets tough, the tough get going. When it seems like all hell's breaking loose around you, and everything's confusing, just get your, get your mind on, let this consume you. I don't, I don't care what book you start in. Don't care, I've said this, don't care what book you start in. But when everything's going wrong and everything's sideways, and you can't see two foot in front of you, whether it's the problems that you've made or what's problems somebody else have made, I promise you this, the more that you focus on this, the less time you have to focus on everything else. And that's how God transfers his peace from him unto you. The problem may still be there and the storm may still be there, but guess what? You'll find the eye which is the most calmest, you'll find the eye of the storm that'll let you rest in the midst of the storm. One of the greatest assets of being in a storm and the boat about to sink is that if you can turn and Jesus is on the boat. Ain't that a great asset? Do you know what, do you know what them boys had to do they had to literally turn from the focus of the storm and go get Jesus. Somebody said they woke him up. Yep, because he is resting. That's amazing in itself. But one thing I do know, there was a man called Jesus that loved them, that cared for them, that, that, that met every need they had. He was on the boat. The problem with when you got a boat and you got a storm and you ain't got nobody on the boat, then you're going to sink. But they literally had to turn their focus off of the storm to get Jesus. And guess what happens? Things start picking up then. So in the middle of that, they that have peace is mind is stayed upon the Lord. Isaiah 26, verse 3, he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind stayed on thee. John 14, 27. You remember John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Well, look at what Jesus said unto the disciples. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Give I unto you. You know what Jesus is saying? The world don't have the peace that you need. That's what he's saying. They, don't, they can't make it. They can't manufacture it. They can't talk it through it. Your peace lies within the Lord because he is the peace. John 14, 27, my peace I leave with you. So I ask question, where is peace found? If God is peace, how does one access the availability of that peace? Mm. Just what I said, whose mind stayed on thee. Access it. Have you ever bought something and never used it? Why do we do things like that? I'm not that way, but I have, I don't know that there's anything I bought that I hadn't used, but, but I know in people that buy a lot of stuff, they must have a buying problem. They'll buy stuff, but they won't use it. You ever bought something, Doug, not used it? Because everything that you bought, you, you, you figured you needed it, so you've used it. So that tells me you're a man that's, that watches his cash flow. So you don't wasteful spend. You don't buy stuff just to be buying. They say that's an addiction. Well, I've never had enough money to do that. To just buy something just to, just to have, to say I've got it. And don't say nothing about my shoes and shirts either. So I do wear them. 
But I got to thinking. I really got to thinking. Why don't we use what we have? If, if, if I entitle God as the God of all peace, that the vast supply is endless, why don't I use it? Why don't I use it? When you look at the peace of God that he's talking about, that he's the God of all peace, and if he's got an endless supply and he never runs out, and the promise is, if your mind stays on me, I'm going to give you all the peace that you need. But you're going to have to meet me halfway. I, I, I'm just not going to give it to you. I have it, but it's here, but why don't you use it? It's there. Just use it. How do you use it? Quit complicating things. It's very simple. If you need it, ask for it. It's like wisdom. He said, if anybody asks wisdom from me, he said, I'm going to give it to you and I won't withhold it from you. All you got to do is ask. I will not withhold it from you. If you need peace, get your mind on him. Ask him for some peace. Do you know why many people say it don't work? Because they don't never try it. This is how we do it. We ask God for the peace. If he's the sole provider for peace, we ask him. Great peace have they which love thy law. Every time I read that verse of scripture, I say, oh me. Great peace have they which love thy law. And you know what the law of God is? That You know every time I've been offended, you know what that tells me? That I ain't been loving the law like I need to. Because if I love the law, you can't offend me. And we live in an age of offense. If everybody's offended, everybody, some people in church offended, just at least a little thing offend them. If you love the law, you ain't got time to be offended. Love the law. Like Brother Mike said, like honey, eat it up. The, the word of God. So the title of God, that God is peace. But. Number two, the power of God is demonstrated. Look what he said. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the power of God. Not only is the, the message about God personified, but look at the power of God, the method of, the, of resurrection. So just stop just a minute. Let's leave the peace of God. Let's look at the power of God. Read that. Told my God is a God of peace. And what did God do? He brought again. What does it say? Read it real carefully. He brought again from the dead. And I had fun playing with this. I did. I, did. I had. <coughs> I, was, I was writing some things down. Did you know when we get through with verse 20 is that if you'll take the God of peace, keep that subject separate. That's his title. But do you realize the rest of this verse explains the peace of God? You've heard me say this over and over in this class. All through the years you've heard me say this. That without the Lord's Christ, without the Lord's Christ, there is no peace with God. Without the Lord's Christ, there is no grace 
of God. Because everything that's embodiment of who God is is personified in the person that he became. But I, I watch, a, I, watch a, I get on YouTube, I watch, I watch videos. Sometimes I want to pick something, I watch videos. Sometimes if I want to look at fishing stuff, I watch fishing stuff on there. And I scroll through there, and then there's all kind of religious promotional things of people making videos. And some of it's about God. And you have different viewpoints of different religions about things. So I watched the other day, I, I seen a guy that's walking through an a, 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 a airport, and he stops and he talks to Jehovah's Witnesses. And he's not vindictive, and he's not, he's not being, he, he, he's trying to, he's trying to deliver the word of God to them. But the problem, the hang up with them is that God is not manifested in three persons. We know that. That's their hang up. And as long as you don't get in depth about Jesus, have the same idea, but when you get into just who he was, not only was he the son of God, he was God incarnate. We believe that. that that's, that's it. God was manifested in three persons. So if I want to magnify who God is and the peace of God, I've got to look at the Son of God because He's going to personify the, the peace of God. He's going to personify the fight power of God, the grace of God. And without the Son of God, you cannot go to the Father. Even Jesus said, no man has seen the Father, I come to declare Him unto you, but He's 100% God and He's 100% man. God manifested in the flesh. But what's interesting, if I were, let's look at the power of God. And I realize the subject is far beyond me to understand how much power God has. We measure power by what he's done or what he can do. And we can't even measure the power of God. But so we can understand it as human beings. We're going to look at the power of God demonstrated. Even Paul said in Romans 1, 16, Brother, Wick, Brother Ricky, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, what Paul said. It's the power of God. Under salvation. Romans 1.16. If I was to look at the creation of God, I'd say, wow, God created the world, the stars, the moon. And you start through the creation, you say, man, that's the power of God. That is the power of God. And it means something through creation. But if I would focus on one event that really magnified the power of God, what would it be? Now, I, I want to help you out with this just in a second. Did you know that every, if, if I was to go through this Bible, would, would we agree as people that there's miracles in this Bible? Who would deny a miracle? If you read this Bible, you'd be foolish to say, first thing, I don't believe in miracles. And I can go through all the pages of the Word of God and I can find miracle after miracle after miracle. Moses throwing a rod down and turned into a snake. That's a miracle, ain't it? Putting a staff into the, wa into the water and it turned red. That's a miracle. 
I could go into the New Testament, I could, I could show you miracle. I, I find a man putting his hand into a, a, a fire and he getting bit by a serpent and he didn't die. That's a miracle. I, 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 see, I see Jesus himself taking somebody that's crippled and making them walk. You see those miracles. And Brother Billy, on and on and on, there's miracle, 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 all through the Bible. And then, for some reason, people start remanufacturing them miracles. They start looking at them and they get a bunch of people together and they sell tickets. And they start remanufacturing miracles. You ever seen them? They do. If, if you've watched a lot of the miracle workers and miracle healers, you'll see them. They, 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 this person's with a cane and he throws the cane away and he's walking and everybody's praising. There have been a few of them that's been debauched. Right? This one was higher, that one was higher. You say, you don't believe in miracles. Oh, yes, I believe in miracles. I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. How would I be a Bible believer and not believe in miracles, Brother Fred? You don't think God works miracles anymore? Oh, yeah, I would be foolish to say that God don't work miracles. I'm a product of a miracle. You're a product of a miracle. God works miracles. And it's sad that the Word of God becomes a vehicle for fraud. I never understood how that you heal, but yet you wear glasses. I don't understand that. Maybe it ain't for me to understand. You, you heal, but you take blood pressure medicine. You heal, but you take thyroid medicine. I don't understand all that. But all through the Bible, there's miracles after miracles after miracles. And then some people get away with them, Miss Francis, and they make a lot of money. But there's one miracle. You listen to me. There's one miracle that these so-called people can't do that the Lord does. You said, How? I think people are very bad deceived. You can't lay somebody When you, listen to me, when you dead, last time I defined dead means dead. You're not half dead. If you fill up and they're cold, they're not breathing, brother, they're dead. And it's a funny thing to me, they can do all the miracles except for one. If you can do everything the Lord done, the Lord raised the dead, did he not? So God's going to let you do all these other miracles. And he's going to keep this one miracle. No, because you're a fraud. And the Bible talks about frauds. But there's one that's not a fraud. And this book said that he is the peace of God. And this peace of God brought to life the Son of God that was dead. And how do I know he's dead? Because the world testified that he was dead. That's why they didn't break his legs. That's why they run the spear in his side, because they wanted to make sure he was dead. And he was dead when they laid him in that tomb. But they something happened in that tomb, and it's called the power of God personified. And this woman of ill repute that was saved by the grace of God, 
searching for the Lord himself with the very words of the angel. He's not here, Mary. So his death, he was dead. The power of God, because of the peace of God, brought up the Son of God from the dead. That's who our God is. That's the power of God. And some of you might have been on death's bed, and God has the power to bring you off of death's bed. But we're talking about the very hope and the very essence of salvation, and the hope of humanity lies within the power of God being on display as the Son of God resurrected, because that's our hope. told Brother Ken yesterday, I said, Brother Ken, we're sitting here rejoicing. I may go for you do, but according to time, your time's about spent. You're on the door, you're on the porch looking in. But I said, our hope is centered around the power of God brought Jesus out of the grave. And we all fellowship because he got up. Brother Ricky, we're going to get up. It don't matter by the grave or the air, but we're going because the power of God. And that's what we're trusting. That's what we're believing in. The power of God personified. Amen.